Welcome to episode four of our New Tech People. Uh, today we've got David Williams. Welcome, David. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Good to hear, mate. Good to hear. Good to see you again. Mate, I think to start off the podcast, I think the easiest and best way for our listeners might be for you to give us a bit of an overview of who you are and what you're currently doing in Newcastle. Sure. Well, um, current, I guess, who, I, who am I? <laughs> that's, a, that's a deep question. So I've been uh, working in IT in Newcastle for over 25 years now since I finished my degree. I grew up and was born in Singleton, uh, so I didn't travel too far. Over the time, I have worked in Sydney, I've worked in Melbourne, um, but fundamentally I've worked in Newcastle. So where I'm at the moment, I'm the Chief Information Officer for Pacific Smiles Group, which is a, uh, a dental corporation that has 80 centres up and down the eastern coast of Australia, but was um, was founded here in, in Newcastle and uh, started off as a Hunter Valley company, which then grew larger. Nice. So it started in Newcastle? It did, yes. So, so actually, it's, I think it's a good story. It's a good Newcastle story. So um, Pacific Smiles Dental started uh, maybe 13, 14 years ago when three local dentists in East Maitland, in Charlestown and Dora Creek, decided to join forces and they, they uh, banded together and then uh, you know, it grew a bit more steam, a couple more dentists joined and slow, so on. Then by 2014, after 10 years or so of that, the company went public. It pushed to get to 30 centres at that point, uh, but then had a strategy of growing by 10 more centres every year. So now it has a much larger footprint, but initially it was certainly a Hunter Valley-based company and uh, definitely a Newcastle East Maitland company. Wow. Yeah. I think, um, and this is the point of the podcast, right, is to shine light on these type of roles. Mate, you're a CIO of a an organisation that has 80 different locations um, in the dentist industry, which uh, I don't think many people would know about, right? Without knowing you or hearing your story, I think I don't think anyone would give any sort of uh, thought behind a, a CIO in a dentist practice. Yes, actually, it's funny. When I went to Pacific Smiles, my father said, you know, why do, why does a dental company need an IT professional? And you think, well, you know, disregarding the fact that the, it's a dentist company, it's a, it's a publicly listed company, it has 80 centres, it needs telephones and networks and uh, there's data and information and there's compliance around that and uh, and so on. So, you know, it is a, a regular business, I guess, like any other, but, it, it, you know, it does feel good as well to be involved in health in some way as well. Yeah, I agree. And the, the technology they use is you know, astronomical these days. I imagine making sure that's all, the you know, connectivities all on point would be most important yes that's right well yes there's um you know we we live and die by our appointment book and uh our telephone but 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 also um you know clinical data has to be carefully guarded uh it has to be very accurate um uh, and protected but also the equipment that's in use as well not only our you know your typical computer and telephone but we have a hundred thousand dollar plus x-ray machines uh, dentistry is moving into fields of 3D printing, with not not just you know regular plastic 3D printer that you might get from Aldi, but very expensive 3D printing to actually make and uh, mould a, a set of dentures for somebody on the spot out of quality quality materials. And these are these are multi million dollar devices themselves. Nice. Mate, let's go into that for a little bit, just because that's <laughs> super exciting. That's something I didn't think would come up. Mate, when when you start to talk about those three D printers, and we're talking about you know that next wave of technology, is that something you get involved with, or is that more down the dentistry route? Like, how do, how did those sort of decisions come about? That that one uh, is more guided by the dentists. So the dentists are keeping on top of what's what's uh, you know what's new in technology in their area. I'm brought in to, I guess, um, you know, assess the general fit with the rest of the network for issues of connectivity and security, but but certainly uh, it, th- those types of things the, that are specific to what the dentists are doing is more driven by them. them. Yeah, nice, Mac. Very interesting. Yeah. All right, let's wind back the clock way to the start, and this is <laughs> sort of a question. There was a HR, HR manager I work with that sort of brought this question up one time, and I thought it was quite interesting, but I was just like, what got you into technology? Sure. Well, um, you know, I g- g- sort of fell into it in a way. In, in fact, so I, uh, you know, a bit older than yourself, James, I was born in the 1970s, so computing wasn't quite a thing then. And actually, when I was a boy, I thought, um, you know, what will I do? I was, I enjoyed maths. I thought maybe I might be a math teacher at one point, maybe an accountant. But uh, in 1984, when I was in year seven and 12 years of age, my father bought the f- first family computer, a Commodore 64, so that was, um, you know, an 8-bit computer. This was at the cusp of sort of home computing. And, uh, you know, I just really fell into it. I, I enjoyed it. I At the time, computer magazines, such as they were, had type-in programs at the back. And uh, 
I just, you know, was just really fascinated by how it worked and making it do things and, you know, learning programming even virtually by osmosis, typing out listings and tweaking them and tailoring them. But even even so, even though that was when I was 12 in year seven at school, I still didn't really envision computing as a career. It was something I was became very interested in. It wasn't until I did my work experience in year 10 in 1987 where I uh, was placed at Leamington Coal Mine down near, near around Singleton uh, where I worked in what they call at the time the EDP centre or electronic data processing, which is what we now know as IT in general. Uh, and, um, you know, there at Leamington Mine they had some VAX uh, microcomputers and, um, you know, they had some simple applications in BASIC. It was all all very different to what we see now. But, but um, you know, working with Sakai Zero was just fascinating. It was, in, you know, I really enjoyed what they were doing. It was, it was tremendous. And uh, that's when I really knew that, you know, that was the career, that was the direction I wanted to go in. So I guess it, it's, you know, it's been a, it was a, it was a started off as a hobby for, you know, a young boy at school and yep. uh, did it as a work experience. And when I finished uh, high school, went to university, did computer science, and I've been in the area since, in the I field am. since. Interesting. Quite a traditional approach to IT then, going through school and then university. Mate, university in technology, I'm sure you've hired enough tech professionals in your day and work with enough. Mate, what's your opinion on university as a necessity in the IT world or for IT professionals? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think it's a necessity. I think uh, that said, I enjoyed my time at university a lot. I, uh, you know, I'm grateful to have my degree, but I think it's not. And I guess the way I look at it is, um, you know, if you were applying for a job straight out of school, you'd probably include your school certificate results or your, or your HSC results on your resume. Uh, but you know, once you then have your degree, you don't you don't put that in your resume. You know, you talk about your degree and the subjects you had. But after a few years of working, you know, I th- I think I would imagine I still have my degree and my resume. But uh, you know, people are looking for your experience and what you've done, and that's I guess the view I take as well. That ultimately, experience trumps education. Education is wonderful by all means, and that helps you get these initial uh, foots in the door and steps. Uh, but but you know, after after you've been working for a few years, it's in my view, it's about what you've done and uh, and so on. So, but so I think I think education's great, but I don't see it as a necessity. I guess what I would see as a necessity is is doing something. And I think in technology, there's probably other avenues that people can do who aren't necessarily academically or mathematically inclined. And I think uh, now we have so many opportunities people can contribute to open source projects. For example, if you uh, you know if you're going for your first job, but you can demonstrate some hobby projects or, or even not necessarily hobby, some real project, something you've done, I think that, that speaks for a lot as well. Mate, I couldn't agree more. I, the, amount of, the amount of people that I'd give recommendations to to actually go and produce something or go and build something or have something to show, it, it, stand, it stands them way in front of the, most of the competition. Um, it's easy to say something on paper to say, hey, I can do this, but actually show that and have examples of that. Uh, people are infinitely you know, well in front of other people if they can actually show that capability. Yeah, terrific. Um, interesting. Um, you mentioned the word fascinating before. I find fascinating the the the, the part of your career when you went down <laughs> you went down the private investigator route. Um, it's probably something that most people wouldn't know about you and yep. probably something that I guess most IT professionals wouldn't do, or most people in general. Private investigators is quite interesting, mate. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, you know, that's a funny story, I guess. Well, I, I um, couldn't really say why I became a private investigator. I think, you know, probably this stems from just a childhood desire to be a spy and, uh, and so on. I mean, I got into IT, but I think... You know, that interest of the shady world of ASIO was always there. It was something, um, you know, that I'd thought about for a long time. I uh, but, but I finally, um, gee whiz, in 2008, I think it was, I, I eventually went for my probationary private investigator's licence. So there's a bit of a process. You have to be approved by the police. You have to, uh, you know, you, don't, you can't have a criminal background. You have to give your fingerprints. So if you're thinking you might want to go into a life of crime, it's probably not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, you know, I guess when people do ask me why investigated, you know, is that different to your normal career? And I guess it is. But, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of linkage, you know, in IT. We have a lot to do with security. We have a lot to do with information, information protection, information gathering. So I think there's a linkage. But uh, certainly it was an interesting time. And I guess, you know, I wouldn't like to describe being an investigator as a hobby because it, it wasn't. But it was, you know, I guess it was a 
fascination and interest and something that I then decided to finally do. And when, um, you know, people uh, find out that I'm a private investigator, one of the first questions is often, you know, have you had to do cheating spouses cases? And I have done some of those where I've followed people and uh, sometimes they've been up to no good and sometimes not. But um, where I end up finding a bit of a niche, a lot of insurance companies in the area engage me to do what they called factual investigation. So there's broadly two types. There's surveillance, which is a more well-known one, but also factual investigation where you'll interview people. And uh, I seem to somehow fall into a niche where I end up with psychological injury, workers' compensation cases. So somebody would say they've been, um, you know, they've, they've sort of suffered a psychological injury in the workplace, so I would go and investigate those and deliver a report. But I found it interesting and fascinating, and I met a lot of people and made a lot of contacts, but... Um, you know, heard a lot of perspectives, but my role was not to uh, make any judgments, but really just to gather information and, and gather the facts and then present that objectively. And, you know, I think uh, what I've done in technology has helped with that. And I think what I've done in investigation has helped me in things that I do uh, in the corporate world in technology as well. well you, mate, you could become a recruiter, interviewing people, background checking. You've got, <laughs> you've got the role wrapped up. Excellent. <laughs> oh, mate, if you ever want a job. Uh, mate, uh, so you've obviously gone more traditional route, technology, you've overlapped that with the private investigator thing. I think that's a, it's a completely different path than the vast majority of people. And I know mixed in there as well as you've done some sort of lecturing as well yes. um, and, and tutoring in and around or work with the Australian Computer Society. Yes. Can you go into that in a little bit of detail? Sure, that's right. And I think, um, you know, a lot of it stems from, I guess, I've been... You know, I've been very grateful to have a good career in IT and I've enjoyed what I do. And I think I think that, uh, you know, probably like a lot of people you might encounter, technology is, you know, it's my passion, it's my hobby, it's, it's I guess, my profession, you know. So it's not so much that I have a job and go to that job and come home. It's, you know, I, I guess I'm, you know, it's part of, intrinsically part of who I am and part of that as well is seeking to, um, you know, I guess give back to that industry to try to develop the skills of newcomers in our industry so certainly yes while I've been working I, I worked at the University of Newcastle for a period of time and uh, while there I did also uh, provide lecturing and tutoring for computer science and for information science and uh, even for the masters of IT MBA courses um, while I was there some of your older listeners may recall there used to be a course called Info 204 which was a COBOL based programming course while I was there I changed that to be SQL Server and .NET, so I modernised that along with Martin Sutton. But um, I've also, as, as you mentioned, been involved in the Australian Computer Society. Uh, <laughs> I was the examiner in programming for the Australian Computer Society. So the Computer Society, um, along with all the various other things it does, it has the um, uh, it assesses people who are applying for migration status in Australia. It assesses their technical skills. And so I was a person who was involved in uh, assessing the programming ability of people claiming to be programmers. But uh, also as part of the Australian Computer Society, I uh, set up a branch here in Newcastle. So we, three years ago, myself and another guy called David Goldthorpe set up a local chapter and we uh, tried having meetings every second month and that that's going along okay. The big problem I have there is more trying to find speakers who appeal to a broad range of, of, of people because the Australian Computer Society obviously has many members with many diverse interests. I set up another user group um, back in 2005 so and this one is still going 13 years later along with Peter Drew who was uh, my co-worker and, and a good friend. Uh, so we started a group called the Newcastle Coders Group and yeah. that was I think I'd like to say is the the first regular Newcastle user group and still I think believe the best and the uh, longer serving <laughs> definitely the longer serving yeah so we, we've you know apart from january's we've met every month since 2005 and our first meeting uh, was in my office and i talked about what the asp.net version 2 as it was back then but um i've since uh you know i've been busy with other things i've fallen a bit out of the coders group and peter himself is you know been occupied with other things but we've had you know, good regular attendance and new blood has come out of that. So two guys, Clay Thomas and John Roach, have been largely running that for the last five years. But, um, uh, yeah, no, th these are, you know, there's, I guess, I think there's a lot of opportunities for people to be involved in many different ways in giving back to the, you know, to the, uh, the technology community if they're interested. I think, you know, your podcast, a terrific example, is exciting. I can't wait to hear the first three e e episodes myself. 
Yeah, mate, I completely agree. So, um, and this is probably a topic that's come up a couple of times, not only on the podcast, but also just in many of the conversations I had regarding those little pockets and groups, uh, especially in Newcastle, right? So I think you, you sort of touched on the point there. There seems to be lots of little siloed groups and you talk about, you know, Australian Computer Society is quite a wide ranging and it's got a lot of breadth to it and trying to find something that appeals to everyone. Um, there are those little groups and pockets and, and meetups that appeal to sort of certain demographics. I think there is a space for whether it be the Australian Cons- Computer Society meetup or or another one that sort of tries to bring people together. I think that is that's the missing point at the moment. I feel in Newcastle. That's my my opinion. Yeah. No. I I, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah, it'll be interesting. We'll see where we can go with this and <laughs> whether the podcast can be a, a you know a stepping stone to to help you know bring people together and bring the different pockets and silos together um that would be ideal i think if uh, if i can help in that way i'd you know happy to excellent that's wonderful but yeah as you said mate there's, there's a lot of people that you can you can start up a, a group but you do need other members of the community to help you know continue that growth and continue that sort of ongoing because it does take a lot of time and effort it does that's true that's right yes no having having other people who can assist is is makes all the difference yeah, completely agree, mate. Let's stay on the Newcastle topic just for a second, then, because uh, obviously we're in Newcastle. You've spent, you know, the majority of your career here. You, you've you've gone away and come back. What brought you back to Newcastle after going away? Well, um, uh, I don't know how do you <laughs> how do you say it without being cheesy, love. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I guess I uh, worked in, um, you know, I after I left the university. So I mentioned I worked at the University of Newcastle. I left there to go to Sydney where I worked for an international call centre software company and that was actually terrific for a time. I, um, you know, I, I worked for them in China and in Singapore and actually at one point I was in the middle of Xi'an in China and I had a translator because I couldn't talk to anyone and I was solving a problem on a phone system and I thought, you know, I can't believe that, you know, it took a boy from country Singleton, you know, country New South Wales to be the guy here in China solving this problem. But uh, I worked there in Sydney and, um, you know, I thought about relocating but uh, at the time I'd um, you know I met a girl who was at university and uh, we you know we got engaged we got married she's so she's my she's been my wife now for let me quickly check what year this is 16 years now oh, good <laughs> but um, but uh, yeah so you know I guess having um, you know have, uh, being in a relationship with somebody who was studying it in, in Newcastle and she had strong ties to the area her family like mine were from the area um, you know, I uh, decided not to move to Sydney. Then I decided I grew tired of commuting to Sydney, so I came and looked for jobs back in back in Newcastle. And uh, and you know, I don't have any regrets. I have had the privilege and the opportunity to travel to a number of conferences and events in San Francisco and Las Vegas, big technology events. And when I leave there, sometimes I feel sad and think, you know, I was really born in the wrong country. But uh, you know what? In Newcastle, you can drive from one side of town to the other and uh, and it takes half an hour, and if you park anywhere, at most it costs three dollars. So you know, there's a lot of advantages in Newcastle over Sydney and Las Vegas and San Francisco. <laughs> Definitely, mate. You just touched on something then, and I think it's probably a good advice piece, maybe that you could provide. Um, you know, younger tech professionals. Uh, a lot of pe- a lot of tech professionals are in Newcastle, and there's a lot more limited opportunity. And you, people might say there's limited sort of educational opportunities as well. But you've actually taken it upon yourself to travel internationally to conferences and things like that. Is there any advice you could provide to people? How you got involved in doing that? Do you, was that sort of self initiated? Would you go search those out and 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 go search out those conferences on your own back? What advice would you give to others to to sort of further ed- educational mindset internationally? Yeah, well, that's that's a good and a and a hard question. I must confess, I don't know if I have a terrific answer. I think, um, you know, funding yourself to go overseas is difficult. I have to admit, I had the fortunate privilege that I was sponsored to go to a number of these events so um, in addition to you know what we talked about to, to lecturing to running user groups and so on I also write a column for a publication called itwire.com so I've as well written for print and online for 30 years and that's really given me some tremendous opportunities that that exposure so so I guess my case you know it's, it's um, a bit trite I guess if I give an answer saying well you know, write, f- f- get, have an audience uh, and, and and write about it and people will send you somewhere. But I think, um, you know, I guess I would encourage people that uh, if they can somehow find the opportunity to go to some of these conferences, it's it's a tremendous, you know, the insights and the exposure you get is, is 
just incredible, not only to specific technologies, but even to just the general trends and thinking. And I would even like to suggest that, um, you know, when you go to some of these events, you can see technologies that's emerging uh, that, that, you know, isn't going to be in production for, for another couple of years. It's really an opportunity to learn what really is going to be the next sort of wave. But as to how people get there, I guess... You know, there's no real good, easy, simple answer, I hate to say, except, um, you know, if you can find somebody generous enough to sponsor you, that's awesome. But otherwise, uh, you know, if you can make your own way there, I think there's definitely a lot of benefits in doing so. Yeah. You mentioned you are lucky enough. I don't know if luck's the actual, you know, the actual answer there because you did mention you've written for, you know, you've got two two blogs running at the moment and you've, yes. you've written how many publications oh you know what i would count it in thousands i i i, I couldn't even say so i actually in uh, when i was still back at high school uh, in 1988 when i was in year 11 i had my first article ever published in the australian commodore review which now you would think about as a car magazine but back then it was a commodore 64 commodore 128 magazine then through university i sold some articles to american publications in Newcastle, I wrote for the Newcastle Herald. They had a weekly Q&A column, some people might remember, uh, for the Australian, for APC magazine. But since in the last 10 years, it's all been online only. But, um, you know, I would have to say thousands, thousands of articles in print and online uh, over that time. Yeah, cool. Um, so when you, when you got into writing, right, you, you've, you've published your first article and you've continued to write. Um, obviously people coming out of university or people very early in the career probably don't have a great deal to say or don't have an audience to speak to. Could you give, I do think it's a, it's a massive career growth opportunity for people to actually produce content to speak at events. I know there's local meetups where people can have speaking opportunities out there, but could you help give people any advice in around, you know, growing an audience or growing a personal brand, so to speak? Um, you've obviously been very successful at doing it. If you could provide tech professionals a some tips around that would be ideal. Yeah, I think, you know, two things come to mind immediately and one one of those is consistency. And I think, <clears throat> you know, with the Coders Group, actually early on, one thing we, we realised was that if we were going to get a, a, you know, a loyal group of people following, if people were going to know just to, you know, that our group was on and didn't have to put much thought into it, was to have that consistency that we would meet every month on the first Wednesday of the month, every month, and, you know, would repeat that message. That's what we do. We meet on the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, and so on. And I think it's the same with writing as well, with blogging. You know, if you can just put out content, if, you know, whatever you can commit to, whether it, even if it's not weekly, if it's not fortnightly, if it's monthly, just that, uh, you know, this same day on this, this same week of the same month is when you put things out and people know to expect that. But I think the other thing is, you know, the, uh, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, people starting out might not have a lot to say, but I think, you know, really, I think, um, you know, people are interested in any challenge that somebody's had and problem they've solved and how they've done it. And even if it seems something trivial, like, uh, you know, I I don't know, in CSS, I managed to get my box to line up nicely. There, you know, there'll be somebody who's undoubtedly searching online, trying to find that exact answer. And I think, um, you know, that's what, that's what people are really interested in, just some... It doesn't have to be a super complicated tutorial. It doesn't have to be a super technical or advanced thing. But you know, if you've um, you know if you've encountered some problem, you're trying to program something or set up something, and and you had to think it through and solve it. You know, writing on that, even no matter how simple you think it is, that's something that people will find interesting and people will be searching on, and and uh, you know, it'll help you get started as well. I I, th I, th I you know highly recommend that. Yeah, I agree. I think people underestimate the, the value of a niche audience, right? It doesn't yeah. matter how narrow it is. If you can solve a problem or provide value to people, it doesn't matter how, how small that audience is. I think that's a good you know a good starting point. Yes, definitely. Oh, awesome. Hey, let's continue down that Newcastle route. Obviously, you know, you've gone away a little bit. You've come back. What do you, what's your thoughts on the current state of the, or the, your thoughts on the current state of the Newcastle technology scene? Yeah, actually, I think it's terrific. You know, when I was at university, I had the feel, as did many people, that, you know, you probably had to go to Sydney to find jobs. And fortunately, I didn't. I, I after I finished my degree, I was, I uh, took up a role with Tomago Aluminium. So that was my first full-time position. So I was fortunate there. But, um, 
you know, I think that's changed. I, I think the, as, as the coders group proves, as the other meetup groups who have mentioned prove, you know, there is a technology scene. But more importantly than that, I think, you know, location just doesn't matter anymore with, with the, um, you know, with cloud-based services, uh, you know, with, with the tremendous things that you can do online, as long as you have a working internet connection and a good idea and, and the ability to execute, I guess, you know, there's all three of those things are needed. You know, you could be based anywhere, and I think Newcastle is a tremendous location. You, it's it's a totally livable city, um, you know, very nice, and there's no reason people can't be developing world-class software or systems here. There's, there's no, you know, you have the same access to uh, Amazon's APIs and platforms here as you would in Sydney. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so the Newcastle, Newcastle tech scene is obviously a growing scene. There's more opportunity now than probably when you came out of university. Is there anything you think we could be doing as a community to help drive further growth, create more opportunity for that next generation locally? Yes, I think, you know, the user groups, the, the podcast, things like this, I think, um, you know, what would be wonderful is making, uh, I guess, a partner, this, this is just sort of thinking off the cuff, but I think, you know, if we could somehow as an industry, um, I guess, collaborate, get you know, some alliance maybe with business and with education where we promote all these sorts of things. I think, you know, at, at university, for example, there's clubs and societies, but there were there certainly weren't user groups and meetups and, and podcasts and this sort of information. When I was there, I think, uh, you know, if current students knew about these resources and could get involved in those events and, and would come to professional groups and meetings, I think, uh, you know, not only the networking opportunities, but the educational opportunities, the exposure to real world problems. I think those things would be tremendous. So I guess, how do you make students aware of that? And, and um, you know, when I say students, not just university students, high school students, people think of entering in technology as a career, whichever path they go through. I guess that's, that's the tricky bit. So I guess, you know, if there was some way we could make these resources known to to um, you know to to educational establishments, secondary and tertiary. I think that would be a good start, just to help people know. You know, if you're thinking of IT as a career, there are you know all these professional networking opportunities that will will help you a lot. Agreed. Agreed. On the flip side of that, what do you think the biggest challenges are for a tech professional for someone like yourself in Newcastle? Yeah, I think well. That, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, even though we've talked about there's great opportunities because you can be in Newcastle and work online anywhere, th- much of the industry is still typical IT. It's, you know, as much as startups are wonderful, not everybody can work in a startup and even a startup has to evolve and mature anyway and become a, you know, a, a real, so to speak, business. So I think there, one challenge I find is, I guess, at Newcastle, the is a limit to the number of senior high-level roles that exist. So that, that for me, has been a challenge. A challenge and I yeah. think that probably will continue to be a challenge. I think, you know, the big companies are going to put their headquarters in Sydney and Melbourne. And I think, whereas I've been fortunate with a company like Pacific Smiles that grew in the Hunter Valley and became a large company, I don't... I, th- I think that's probably, you know, the exception more than the rule. It's going to be hard to find a big company, a global company, an established brand that wants to set up its headquarters... And it chooses Newcastle over over a major city. So I think that is something that Newcastle will still continue to struggle with. That you know that that a lot of big companies aren't headquartered here, and that they, as people go through their career, they probably are going to find the opportunities are fewer at the higher end. I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think you know the holy grail would be to try to attract some bigger companies to Newcastle. That's you know way beyond the technology scene. That's beyond. You know, that's Newcastle as a whole, right, to create more job opportunities for, for everyone locally. Yes. Um, and that's that's the changing face of Newcastle, though, I think, as a whole, right? We're, we're being very singularly industry-focused over time. Yes. And we're, <laughs> we're diversifying out of that. And how Newcastle evolves over the next, you know, 5, 10, 20 years will be interesting to see. But if we could attract more sort of global or you know, at least national businesses to, to Newcastle with their headquarters being here or, or a, a, a major office being here where we can have those sort of senior management positions, that would be ideal, obviously yeah. from a tech perspective, but yes, from a greater you know employment perspective as well, right? Yes, oh, that would be magnificent. Imagine if uh, you know Microsoft had a major office here or Amazon or Google, that would be awesome, that wouldn't would be it? Phenomenal. <laughs> you know, if Amazon's listening. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all good, mate. Um, you're in a CIA role at the moment. 
Yes. You attend a lot of conferences. You write a lot of blogs. You're obviously a pretty busy man. From a productivity perspective, how do you get it all done? Is there a, is there a tool that you use on a day-to-day basis that helps you from a productivity perspective? Yes, actually I um, I do. I use a, a couple. There's the, the main one that I use for productivity is called OmniFocus, which um, is available for... Uh, only for Apple devices, unfortunately. So there's no Windows version. It is a you know Mac and a iPhone, iPad app, but but there's there's other equivalents. But it's a simple tool and it follows a methodology which I've been reading about called GTD, which simply stands for getting things done. And yeah. you know the whole point of that sort of framework is you know documenting all the things you need to do and reviewing them and prioritizing them. And you know whether you follow that framework or any other one, simply the point is you know, you need to dump what's in your brain into a list and you need to ensure that list is sorted and categorised and uh, and ultimately that you're disciplined to, to do those things. There's no point having a massive to-do list if you don't do anything on it. <laughs> but uh, but at the same point, you know, you have to you have to free your mind and dump these things down and, and, and uh, work on them. And also, as well, part of that, I think, is breaking up bigger projects into smaller pieces so that you have... Uh, you know, achievable, achievable chunks, but uh, but that's an app I use every day. OmniFocus. Yeah, yeah, OmniFocus. Interesting. I have heard. I think I've read the Getting Things Done book many, many years ago. I didn't actually get it into practice, <laughs> unfortunately. Might have to revisit that one day. Yeah, I, I like it. That's all good. It's made, everyone's got different sort of avenues and ways about going about productivity. I think that's um, it's, you know, it's very important that somebody's got something set up. So, you know, somebody might be able to check that out. Get check out getting things done and also OmniFocus and it might provide them some help. Yeah. Awesome. May, uh, anything from a educational perspective, maybe outside of formal education, is there any podcast you listen to on a regular basis that you think would be extremely helpful for someone else to listen to? Um, yes, well, there's several. I'm Actually, I'm looking forward to the Newcastle Tech podcast, to, to hearing that. That's going to be awesome. But um, beyond that, I listen to a couple of podcasts. There's... Uh, you know, various business-related ones, so ones for CIOs and new emerging technology. But, um, you know, I also like, I enjoy listening to some more consumer-oriented ones. There's a, a good one that the ABC have called uh, Download This Show, which is quite a conversational, uh, you know, very light-hearted talk about what's happened in technology during the week. And, and you know, I quite enjoy that. I think um, as well as business technology, it's good just to keep abreast of general trends and, uh, you know, what's what's emerging. I agree. I think you know, widening your your eyes to other things that are going on can help provide ideas that then you can take back and sort of narrow into your day to day office. Um, when you said when you said some of the the more tech focused CIO focused ones, is there any names that you could any names of the podcast we could share with listeners? Uh, yes, I would have to pull my phone out. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Oh, good. <laughs> okay, sorry, just bear with me. Okay, yeah, so. A couple that I listen to are the CIO Playbook with Jeffrey Hurley and the CIO Talk Network podcast. Um, there's a GTD, Getting Things Done podcast, if people are interested. There's uh, another one called Manager Tools. Um, there's actually one I quite enjoy is the Forbes interview, which has a uh, guy called Stephen Burton who uh, will talk to different executives and leaders. So. Um, you know, sometimes it might be CEO of Oracle or or somebody from Uber or things like that, founders of startup companies, and that's quite fascinating. He talks, similar to you, James, he talks to people about what they've done and where they've come from and where they're going. Yeah, I find it really, you know, helpful to find out what challenges other people are going through. Um, obviously, you would get that from podcasts. Sort of on that same note, from a networking perspective, you're obviously at that sort of seed level and there's not too many people at your level around Newcastle. How do you go about networking with other sort of senior executives? Yeah, that, that one is harder. Generally, a lot of uh, executives don't tend to come to user groups or meetings or things like that. But often, um, you know, vendors will organise events. So uh, Telstra, for example, might often put on a, you know, a, f- a function or sometimes a breakfast, but sometimes something else where they'll invite senior people from around the area or in Sydney, some of the vendors there, Jamalto, who's a security company, will release a report on the state of IT security, you know, 2018 or something like that, where they'll talk about research they've done, and they'll invite senior people around to have to hear that. So I think generally the networking with executives is is probably performed more, I think, at vendor-led functions. But uh, but you know they're good events. They're good to you've got people 
in the room who uh, I guess uh, the reason they're there is because they're experiencing a particular business challenge, the same as yourself. So it's interesting to hear their fo- their their um, you know their thoughts on it and the challenges they're having and the solutions they've been looking at, and and so on. Yeah, I agree. I think networking is super important. Yes. Um, back down that education or any books that you would recommend to people? Um, yeah, there's actually you know there's a book I've read early on a long time ago which still sticks with me and it was a book called Death March by Edward Uden which sounds like a terrible title but what he meant by Death March was you know you're assigned to a project so back in those days you know large companies had large projects and they'd assign project teams from across the business but um, you know if you were put in a project that had had a lot of money sunk into it and had gone over time over and over and nobody expected expected it to succeed and you were probably going to fail they called that Death March in this sort of terminology there but uh, this book was about you know how do you turn these projects around how do you you know how do you actually deliver um and so that book even though i read that a long time ago i think it's still a timeless classic and it really stuck with me another one uh another one which is a, f- a famous book is the mythical man month which is also you know about projects and people and people management and leadership so these these are two good books but of late i've been looking at some other books there's one that i've just started reading called um, you know, the business of IT with the business being sort of a play on not only the business of IT but, but about business because it's a business-focused book about how CIOs can demonstrate and deliver value and that's, I guess, on my mind because, um, you know, as technical people we often talk about something and, you know, we, we share the same assumptions or we understand the ramifications of something immediately just by talking about it but when you're trying to communicate to a business audience, uh, you know, they don't have that same that same understanding, which which isn't to say they don't have any understanding. They they you know they they obviously come from different areas of business, and you might say, I don't know, we need to replace this device or we need to upgrade this thing, and the reasons for that are are obvious to you and self evident, and would be to any technical audience. But you know, to a company, all they know is you want to change something that works to something else, and you know, cost money. You know, it's it, it's really at um, about how do you demonstrate you know when you want to talk to that audience how do you demonstrate that you're giving value and so that's that's why that's been in my mind and so that book you know the business of it is one i've been reading of late which which is about i guess strategies to communicate with non-technical people about what it really does in a business sense that's a massive challenge for it and i think as tech professionals as you grow up the chain right i think you can stay super technical and continue to grow from a pure technical perspective or you can go down that sort of management route and that the differentiator between the two is that communication ability? Yes. Is there anything you did from a communication perspective? Any any training you did or any sort of books you've read or education you undertook to help improve from a communication perspective? Yeah, well, certainly books. But um, actually, you know, it's funny when you talk about communication because, um, you know, uh, when I was at school, I was, uh, you know, very timid and quiet and reserved person, the same as at university. But, um, you know, I think I've developed the ability to talk to people through well, through doing it and through part of that was tutoring. And actually, you know, when I started lecturing at university and tutoring, I uh, would come into the room and I'd, you know, have to force myself to to cough or make some noise so I, before words could start coming out of my mouth and I could talk. And from then it was okay. But, you know, just from that experience of doing it, and I think, um, you know, for technical people, I think, as much as I wouldn't want to stereotype, I think it's probably true that a lot of technical people are you know, uh, into into machines and maybe more reserved and slightly quiet and, and, and these are good and fine things and that's what makes people good technical people a lot of the time. But I think um, you, you're exa- you're absolutely right. Communication is that s- missing piece that, that uh, well, that's what the business wants uh, and, you know, at the heart end of the day, all problems are people problems, they're not technical problems. And I think, um, you know, unfortunately, I think it's not a skill that somebody teaches you or just in part it's something you have to learn from from doing and and sometimes that doing is putting yourself in difficult positions but i think starting off gently talking at a user group giving presentations on the problem you've had like we've been talking about you know i think these are things that will help people do that or explaining ideas to their co-workers but um beyond that no i think you know it's a sort of a shame really that a lot of people I think are elevated to management positions without any real training and and in a way it's a compliment but you know people are people and and whether it's technology or or a mechanic at a, at a mine or things like that you know people often are elevated 
because they're good at what they do. Somebody thinks, you know, you're doing a great job as a recruiter. You know, we want you to now be the general manager of our recruitment business. And suddenly you're thrust into that role where you're no longer doing the things you did and were good at, but, but you're now having to deliver difficult conversations to employees or you're having to manage budgets or uh, look at performance reviews and pay cuts and company strategy. And, and, and really there is no... You know, it's probably a shame. There is no training for that. It's something you have to, you know, you have to take on yourself by experience, by doing, by reading. Um, so I, I guess as to your question, you know, it, it was from looking and, and wanting to improve. And I think, I guess that's the key thing. You know, you, you need to want to improve in these areas because nobody will, nobody will do it for you. And uh, Yeah, sorry. So there is no real course uh, or, or easy answer there, but fundamentally, you know, from wide reading, from wanting to be better at what you do and wanting to deliver value, you you um, you know find find ways, whether it's attending groups or reading books or or things like that. I, I would certainly recommend anyone uh, do what they can to improve themselves. Yeah, awesome. On that note, then, advice for your younger self, or advice for somebody who's coming out of uni, if you ha- if you had to think back. What's one key piece of advice that you give to you know, a younger version of David Bullion? Oh gosh, well, <laughs> probably one one advice. Uh, probably a couple. Um, you know, I think uh, one thing is that I probably wish now, looking back at where I've gone, is that I had taken some business-related electives at university. So I I did physics and stuff like that, and statistics as my electives, which were interesting. And at the time, I thought I was going to be very uh, you know, technical. I didn't know where my career would lead. Looking back now, I wish I had taken, uh, you know, accounting 101, for example, as a subject. And even if I'd never did anything more in depth with that, I think just having those business fundamentals would have been very helpful. That said, I don't necessarily think that's for everyone. Some people, um, you know, will always be in a very technical role, and that's tremendous, and that's awesome, and that's great for them. But if you, uh, but you know, I think if people do have careers that lead them into a more business oriented role having some of those fundamentals of knowledge you know would have been helpful i i think that that's been a hindrance to me in a lot of ways and i wish i had maybe more a greater understanding of some accounting fundamentals and had done that i think another one is um you know look after yourself i think this is something i probably learned a bit too late in life and that is you know that we do have a very sedentary career uh and uh you know knowing uh, how to lead a healthier lifestyle is probably a good thing to do when you're younger than trying to catch up when you're older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everyone sits behind a desk, you know, day in, day out, especially in the tech profession. And yeah, yep. there is uh, a lot to be said for sort of a healthy body, healthy mind. Yes, no, definitely. That's awesome. Mate, is there anything else you'd like to share with people about, you know, what you're currently working on or, you know, any events you're attending upcoming? Yeah, well, um, you know, what I'm working on at the moment is... Uh, is business intelligence. When I came to Pacific Smiles, which, you know, it's a tremendous company uh, and it's done some awesome things, but the company grew rapidly, which which is exciting. But at the same time, it didn't have a great handle on, on its data and information. The company had a lot of information available to it, but it wasn't, it wasn't hugely accessible. People, you know, if the general manager uh, wanted to know why a certain result was, was, was why it was, you know, it took a lot of effort to get people to re- reconstruct that information. So I've been working on a business intelligence platform that delivers, you know, dashboards and information and drill downs and things like that. And seeing the effect that has on people is, is you know, is just so exciting. And, and whether it's that project or a different project, I think, you know, everybody in their technology career, if they have some project like that where you can just transform a business rather than, uh, you know, rather than just maintaining the status quo, but can do something that changes the way people work or changes how people do their job you know i think it's 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 a tremendous thing and i think my general philosophy in it has been that you know fundamentally uh in an internal facing it department really you know why you're there it's it's not so much to um you know you could give a list of very specific things that you do whether it's you know run the mail server or phone system or whatever but ultimately i think we're here to optimize the rest of you know to optimize the rest of the business to make everybody else better at their job through technology and i think focusing on things like that and and remembering you know that this is why you're there and thinking about what your drivers are 
um, you know, are things that I think will help people stand people in good stead in their in their careers. Yeah, looking at technology like an enabler, right? You're enabling yes. the rest of the business to X, Y, Z. That's it. Yeah, definitely not as not as an end in itself, but but uh, you know, to deliver to deliver business value to to help other people do what they do better. Agreed. Agreed. Hey, mate, if uh, someone wants to get in touch with you, um, where's the easiest place for people to find out more information or get in contact? Sure. I have a uh, website which has my contact details and information about various events and things I'm at. So that's www.davidmforbarkwilliams.com. Awesome. We'll uh, we'll link that up in the show notes and uh, along with your LinkedIn profile. Oh, yes. Wonderful. Awesome. Not a worry. Mate, thanks Thanks for uh, coming in and taking (laughs) your time today. No, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks. (laughs) Thank you.